I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small, encounters that move us beyond words. I was raised by a single mother, and I was completely estranged from my father's side of the family. My father left when my mother was pregnant with me, and they were engaged to be married, and my whole family was shocked because the you know wedding was planned, and he just walked out. Ava Chin grew up the only child of a single mother in Queens, New York. This was back in the 1970s and 80s. She was also the only Chinese-American in her white working-class neighborhood. No matter that she's a fifth-generation New Yorker, she felt like an outsider, and that loneliness was compounded by her yearning for a father. Before he left her mother, Stanley Chin made it clear that he wasn't interested in being a father to the unborn Ava. He was divorced, 14 years older than Ava's mother, and already had children. I always wanted to know this family that I only ever heard about, spoken about in whispers. I knew that they were big wigs in Manhattan's Chinatown. It was only a borough away, but it could have been Scotland for as far as we were concerned in terms of the gulf that was between us as families. Ava's mother, the Jilted Bride, was so angry with Stanley that one day when Ava was in third grade... She burned a photo of the man right in front of Ava, who, as it turns out, was in that moment seeing a picture of her father for the very first time, and she was devastated. In that brief moment before the image vanished, she realized how much she looked like her father, sharing his high forehead and cheekbones. She tried to snatch the photo away, but it was too late. Years later, finished with college, Ava went looking for her father in the flesh, She still wanted to know what had only ever been whispered about. How did this branch of the family become bigwigs in Chinatown? When did they immigrate to the United States? What had they been doing here? If Ava Chin had felt walled off from knowing her father, her search to find and understand him led her right up against another story of exclusion, a story bigger than her own, affecting all early Chinese immigrants to America. In California, over 200 towns pushed out their Chinese residents. As she began in earnest to sleuth out whatever she could about her father, his whereabouts, and his backstory, Ava learned the disgraceful history of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which severely limited the rights of Chinese immigrants, even those who had been in the U.S. for decades. These were her people. This episode of Constant Wonder is about searching. Ava's search for her father, that was her original quest. But that pursuit led to many, many stories of relatives who had immigrated here over the last century and a half. We can only sample a few of these stories. But still, the stories we will share reveal how her grandparents and the generations before them wrestled with and eventually learned to outsmart and overcome the discrimination of this Chinese Exclusion Act. The story of Ava's relationship with her father and the painful discoveries she has made about her family's history, these are all stories of being shut out. And Ava has had to wrestle with her own place in these narratives. She's now come to locate herself in the history she once felt cut off from. And when I say locate, I mean emotionally, of course, but also physically. Which is to say that she now has an apartment in the same building where her family had lived for several generations. She was an adult before she even knew of the building's significance. When I touched the banister of the staircase, I realized that the young hands of my grandmother and then my father and his siblings and the family members that I never met, they had all touched that banister. It was to be a surreal sort of reconnecting with the past. Ava Chin is author of the memoir Mott Street, a Chinese-American family's story of exclusion and homecoming. Manhattan's Mott Street is a narrow, busy street 
It functions like the main street of Chinatown, crowded with fish and vegetable markets, noodle houses, Chinese bakeries, souvenir shops. Nearly every week of her childhood, Ava's mother and maternal grandparents would take her from Queens over to Mott Street an hour's journey by subway. Little Ava, who wanted so badly to know her father, had no idea that as she bustled along with other shoppers on that street, relatives she had been cut off from were coming and going, sharing the very same pavement. The grandparents on my father's side, who I never met, were actually living in a building in the heart of the community. And it was a building that I passed so many times in childhood, and I never ran into them. So we were actually very close geographically, but the emotional gulf was vast. She felt out of place in Queens. On those weekly visits to Chinatown, she felt at home. They were filled with, like, family gatherings over copious amounts of food. And so there was a great pleasure being in touch with our heritage because of the food and that sort of the togetherness of eating our meals together. There was something really comforting about walking around Chinatown where I could just be a little kid versus being seen as, oh, an Asian kid or a Chinese kid, the way that I was viewed in Queens. You mentioned whispers and the bigwigs and that side of the family that you didn't know much about. And that's your father's side of the family. By contrast, on your mother's side of the family, things weren't kept free. I would imagine with all that food and the togetherness, that's probably where the family stories got told in a big way. They loved sharing stories at family events. And I was the kind of kid that loved to listen to all of the family stories. So I knew stories about my maternal grandfather and his family and how we were proud descendants of Chinese railroad workers. My grandfather, who raised me, knew his grandfather, who was the railroad worker. The first person in our family to come over to this country in the 1860s and who worked on the nation's first transcontinental railroad that at least physically united the country after the Civil War. His name was Wong Yuan Sun. Was he kind of a hero figure? Definitely. I must have been about three years old when my grandfather would tell me these stories. I would roll out of bed on a Sunday morning, and he would tell me stories about his grandfather, who had gone to America out west. Chinese people still called America Gong San, which means Gold Mountain. They called it by its Gold Rush name. Really, the name refers to California during Gold Rush days, but by extension, the entire country was considered the Gold Mountain. Wan Sun came over when he was a teenager to work on the railroad. China at the time had dealt with two opium wars with the West, a really bloody civil war, And our part of the country dealt with drought that led to famines. They were desperate to find ways to feed themselves and their families. And so when Yuan Sum came over, I don't think he realized exactly how difficult the work was going to be. Chinese people worked on the most difficult part of the railroad, which was blasting their way through the Sierra Nevada to create tunnels for the railroad to go through. To punch a tunnel through mountain granite, a team of men would use a massive chisel so big it took four men to hold it aloft while a fifth man pounded it with a sledgehammer. They'd rotate the chisel, pound again, over and over until they had a hole big enough to pack with blasting powder. Or they'd dangle from cliffs in baskets loaded with explosives, which they would pack into cracks in the vertical face. This was all done before the invention of dynamite, and the work was so painstakingly slow that the tunnels advanced only about one foot per day. Chinese people like Yuan Sun had to deal with two winters, two very brutal winters and over 40 feet of snow to get through the Sierra Nevada and lay down this track. The Sierra Nevada, which as many of us remember, 
was the same area that two decades prior, the Donner Party got stopped in its tracks during that really brutal winter. Did your grandfather know all of these details, or was it more sort of a romanticized notion? I mean, I don't mean to undercut the challenge of what happened, but I'm just wondering if when these stories are told, there's a nice sheen that kind of covers some of the suffering. Well, he never talked to me about the fact that so many Chinese people died while building the railroad. He said it was hard labor, but he never talked about the deaths. Even now, they're not 100% sure how many people actually did die because they didn't keep adequate counts. The only ways that we know approximately how many people died were the bodies or the bones had to go back in shipments to California, and then eventually they made their ways back to our villages in China. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there were things that my grandfather did not talk about. And actually, one of the things he never talked to me about until way later was what happened after the railroad was completed. Because after the railroad was completed, unfortunately, there was a very deep economic depression. They called it the Great Depression at the time, an enormous amount of economic suffering. And you had many immigrants, including European immigrants from the East Coast and East Coasters who were looking for jobs. They jumped on the railroad that Yuan Sun and his countrymen helped build wound up in the American West, and they discovered Chinese people living and working there in occupations and jobs that they thought were rightfully theirs. These were jobs in manufacturing and logging, fishing, that kind of thing. So unfortunately, coupled with that economic strife, I think some of the worst aspects of human behavior can come out. So what happened is in the 1870s and the 1880s and 1890s, there was this intense anti-Chinese sentiment. A lot of politicians then jumped on the bandwagon, using it as a platform. And in 1882, that anti-Chinese sentiment helped to create the Chinese Exclusion Act laws, and those laws were the very first time our country shut its borders against any particular nationality. And so that was heartbreaking. The U.S. government turned on the Chinese, refusing to accept any more manual laborers from China. This choked off most legal immigration from that country. Ava Chen, on a very personal level, realized the intensity of these racist attitudes when she discovered what happened to her great-great-grandfather, Yuan's son. With the railroad completed, he moved to Idaho for new work. Idaho's population, by 1870, was nearly 30% Chinese. Yuan's son initially worked in a silver mine, then opened a dry goods store and gambling parlor in Boise. The other part of it that my grandfather didn't tell me right away, I didn't learn this until I became an adult, was that Yuan Sun, who was happily living in Boise, Idaho at the time after the completion of the railroad, who had been living there for two and a half decades, got forced out of his home. These were things that were not told to me as a child because I was too young. You mean literally forced out? Is that what happened? Yuan Sun got a knock at the door. And his neighbors, oftentimes when I wrote about it, I wanted to call them vigilantes, but I later learned that that was a misnomer. These were not simple rioters. Oftentimes, there were riots to push Chinese people out that were led by the mayors, the leaders of the town, judges, the sheriff and his deputies. People didn't want him, so they pushed him out. It was horrifying, really. I later learned through doing research that in California, over 200 towns pushed out their Chinese residents. After he was run out of his own home in Boise, Yuan Sun went back to China. He would marry and have two children in his 40s, settling there in the village he had come from. His grandson would be the one from that line who came back to the U.S., and this was the man who would become Ava Chin's grandfather, who on Sunday mornings would tell the stories of their honored ancestor who built the railroad. <laughs> 
The pain of learning about Yuan Sun, the hero figure who built the very railroad that linked this country together from coast to coast, that pain was intensified when Ava learned about the official Chinese Exclusion Act that targeted and oppressed all Chinese Americans. All of that sorrow was exacerbated by the fact that she knew nothing about the other side of her family, her father's side. I had this great yearning to understand who I was in relation to this family that I never knew. And I really wanted to understand who this father was, who I had only heard stories about, but from the people who were mad at him, right? I wanted to really understand him in a more three-dimensional way. Ava Chin's yearning to understand herself was only in part a focus on her father. So much more was at stake for her psychologically. The message that you get about growing up with a single mother is that you're lacking something. Or when I was growing up in the 80s, the idea of a single mother was that they were contributing to the welfare state, although we weren't on welfare, but that there were all of these negative connotations about the way that I grew up. And I thought that if I could understand who he was, I would better understand myself. I knew that I wanted to be a parent myself. I felt that I could never be 100% a good parent if I didn't understand what happened between my own parents. So I was really, really afraid of meeting my father. When I was in grade school, I actually snuck into my mother's telephone book. This is when we had little address books, right? And I found his phone number, and I actually called him. But then I totally lost my nerve because I thought, well, what am I going to say if he picks up the phone? And it rang a couple of times. No one picked up. I hung up. I couldn't do it. I felt like what would happen if he rejected me all over again? So it was only until I was in my mid to late 20s when a series of events happened, coincidentally, my mother ran into my half-sister, my dad's first daughter. They ran into each other at a work conference. And my sister asked my mother, well, does she ever want to meet him? And my mother, being the kind of proud person that she is, flat out lied. She said, no. No. She doesn't care. (laughs) She doesn't want to meet her dad. And I was like, how could you say that? I've always wanted to know him. In the course of this mother-daughter conversation, Ava's mother let slip that Ava's other half-sister worked at a magazine. Ava herself was working for magazines at the time, so she used her connections and reached out to that half-sister. It was that kind of baby step that I needed to take before actually meeting my dad for the first time. And so my sisters gave me my father's information, and then I had to call him again. Don't ask me why he couldn't call me, right? But six months went by, and I finally got the nerve to call him. And we met in Chinatown. We met on a block that I had walked numerous times before. I met him at his office in a building that I had seen many, many times. I was shocked to learn that indeed we did look like each other. We sounded alike. It turns out not only do we have the same walk, but we have the same taste in clothing. It was very, very strange to encounter this person who was my father, but that I had never met, and then realize that, wow, hereditary genes, they are very strong. (laughs) This was not one of those stories where estranged parties meet at the airport and embrace, and there's a grand reunion. This is not that. Right, right. This is a more heartbreaking story of real life. Asking my father lots and lots of questions, his being a little defensive, but he was open enough to say it was getting later. Let's continue the conversation over dinner. We walked out onto the street 
And we were in the middle of Chinatown. It was around rush hour. People were on the street shopping before going home. We were walking down Pell Street and he pointed out different landmarks in Chinatown. Do you see that over there, that store? That was where our first store was. And we turned that store into Chinatown's first coffee shop. And then he pointed in another direction. And I said, see that basement over there? When I was a kid, that was an opium den. And then he finally pointed straight up the block to where the street dead ended into another block. And there was a six-story red brick apartment building. And he pointed out a window on the right-hand side. He said, see that window over there? That's where my grandparents, your great-grandparents lived. And you see that window over there? And he pointed somewhere to the left. And he said, that's where my parents lived after they got married. And that's where I was born. It was a period in time in which people were born at home, not in hospitals. And I was shocked to realize that this building I had walked past numerous times before had, in fact, housed so many of my family members. On both sides? Well, let's say a month or two later, I was talking to my grandmother over the phone, the maternal grandmother who raised me. And she also had been born at home and in Chinatown. And I asked her, well, what was the address of this building? And then she told me. And it was the same exact building as the one that my father was born in, where my entire chin side had lived. Then, as I started asking more and more questions, I realized both sides of my family had indeed, generations before I was born, been upstairs, downstairs neighbors from each other. They had gone to the same schools, gone to the same churches. And once they started buying summer homes, it turned out not only were they neighbors in Chinatown, but they were neighbors out on the Jersey Shore as well. So these families had, dare I say, fairly intimate connections with each other going back for the generations, or at least very close? Absolutely. They were friends and classmates. They played basketball together. They were in Boy Scouts together. So they were completely connected to each other. Eventually, after meeting her father for the first time, Ava got the chance to go inside what was kind of like her ancestral home. The first moment I walked into that building, I really felt like it was Alice going through the looking glass. Like I felt like I had walked through a portal that was transforming me through time to all of these different generations of family members that have been born in our building. I remember when I touched the banister, the handrail of the staircase, which is a spiral staircase, and I realized that the young hands of my grandmother and then my father and his siblings and the family members that I never met, they had all touched that banister. They had all run up and down those stairs. It was even funny one time... I was running down the stairs. I had this tendency to run down stairs. And then a, a, a friend of the family said to me, oh yeah, chins always run down the stairs. You don't stop. He's just like, do, 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 do. and I was like, oh, I didn't realize that that was a trait that I had inherited. But I think about that every time I run down the stairs. And the first time I ever met my father, the first image I saw of him was as a pair of feet running down the staircase of his office building. So there was this thing about running downstairs. There's a way in which we're so connected in ways that ordinarily you don't think about. But I think because I was estranged from that side of my family for so long, I noticed them. And they are precious connections to my family and my heritage. The building on Mott Street would become of such significance to Ava that she would procure an apartment there to use as a writing studio. That apartment used to belong to her great uncle and aunt. 
We've told you the story of Wang Yuan-sun, whose neighbors forced him out of his home. He returned to China. But there are yet other ancestors of Eva's who actually came over during the years of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Well, how'd they do that? They, getting around the law. They used a trick that helped them get into the country and then evade deportation. And this deception was made possible by a fluke of history. Ava Chen will explain in just a moment. She's author of Mott Street, a Chinese-American family's story of exclusion and homecoming. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Pausing here now for just a few seconds to let you know, dear listener, how thrilled we are that Constant Wonder has been named a finalist in the Religion and Spirituality category of the second annual Signal Awards. It's a distinct honor to be recognized among the best in the podcast industry. We're also in the running for a Listener's Choice Award, selected by people like you. You can help us out. Just visit our website, byuradio.org slash constant wonder, and there you'll find a link to vote for our podcast in the Signal Awards. Voting is open through October 5th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. China's exclusion was our country's first immigration restrictions. It was on the books from 1882, and it lasted till 1943. It only ended during World War II when our country needed an ally in China against Japan. And for those 61 years, it halted our legal Chinese immigration into this country and it blocked a pathway towards our citizenship. And yet many of Ava Chin's ancestors were able to work around the restrictions. To illustrate what it was like for her people coming over here during those six decades, let's get another story from her family history. Here's what happened with a set of great-grandparents on her mother's side. Her great-grandfather, named Wu Do Shim, Shim for short, made his first trip to the U.S. at the turn of the 20th century. The Chinese Exclusion Act was in force, but it did allow entrance for Chinese students and allowed Chinese immigrants to work specifically in business. But only after getting through a lot of red tape, of course. Shim went to prep school in New England, that's the student part, and became a prosperous merchant in New York City, that's the business part. Hearing of his success, his parents back in China insisted that it was time for Shim to come back to China to marry. To leave the U.S., Shim had to round up four white witnesses willing to testify that he had done no manual labor in the previous year, and then he had to obtain an immigration official's affidavit clearing him for subsequent re-entry into the U.S. Having tended to all of that humiliating paperwork, Shim set off for China to meet the woman his parents had picked out for him. However, he stopped off in Hong Kong, became besotted with someone he met at church there, and he rebelled against his parents' wishes, marrying this devout church-going woman instead. They were progressive Chinese Christians. They did not have an arranged marriage, which was very common at that time in China. So they bucked the trends and they got married and fell in love because of their mutual faith. Shim and his new wife, Chun, stayed in Hong Kong for over a year. They had a baby and then grew anxious to set up household back in New York where Shim's legal business was. Here things got tricky. Remember, Shim had gone through interviews with immigration officials. He had rounded up the requisite witnesses. He had obtained the paperwork specifying that he could re-enter the United States. He, but wives and children were not automatically allowed in. And it just so happened that immigration officials were clamping down right during the months that this little family was trying to relocate. So Shim and Chun traveled separately. He directly back to New York and Chun in a much more roundabout way. She was a young mother. She had an eight-month-old daughter in tow, and my great-grandfather did not want her to get stuck in a detention center. She came over around the turn of the century. It was before Angel Island, which was a detention center that sometimes is called the Ellis Island of the West. It was not a welcome center, though. It was a detention center. At that time, 
that detention center didn't even exist. Chinese people were often stuck on boats. It could be months before you were allowed to get off the boat. So he did not want my great-grandmother and the baby to be stuck in steerage for so many months. So she was forced to come over through Canada into northern New York. Because the laws were so restrictive, folks needed to come up with different aliases in order to get in. In 1906, okay, let's test your American history. You're a Californian. <laughs> what happened? What major catastrophic event happened well, in yes, 1906? Indeed. In San Francisco, we're talking about a big earthquake. That's right. That's right. So the earthquake was felt all the way from Oregon down south to Los Angeles. But the largest impact by far was in San Francisco. And the earthquake, the tremors triggered these great fires. What happens at that time then is that so many buildings caught fire, including the City Hall of Records. And when the City Hall of Records burns to the ground, all of those documents, the birth records, the death records of 49ers, of people born and raised in California, they're all destroyed. And this is an opening in the giant wall of Chinese exclusion, whereby now Chinese people can say, oh, actually, I'm a citizen because I was born here and my birth certificate burned in the great earthquake. Or my father was born here and so I am the son of a citizen. Many of these were fabrications. And again, it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have these discriminatory legislation, but this is the ways in which people were able to circumnavigate the laws. And that's the short and simple origin story behind paper names, invented identities calculated to flout the authorities. Ava Chin actually first learned about this practice not through her research. She simply stumbled across it as a child visiting with her grandparents. This would have been in about the late 1970s. So the first inkling I ever got of this was when I was a kid, I noticed that the mail to my grandparents' house was coming under a name that I didn't recognize. So I asked my grandmother, who's this person on the mail? And she said, oh, that's for grandpa. But I was like, that's not his name. And she said, that's his paper name. And I thought, well, I don't know anybody else whose grandfather has mail coming to him under a different name. Is he living here under a different alias? Is he possibly illegal? But how could my grandfather be illegal when his grandfather helped build this great apparatus that benefited the entire country? It doesn't make any sense to me. And so I think that all of these things combined made me realize that there was a much larger story here than just what was happening to my grandfather and to my family. As you put the big picture together, little by little over years, whether it's finding the mail or whether it's researching and knocking on your father's door, finding about his family's story and background, as you put this all together, things just seem to get... Well, I would have to say that I would start to feel some visceral anger about the ongoing, long-term treatment of my family in America. Well, you know, underneath anger is what? It's pain, right? And what what often happened as I was interviewing people and doing this research reading newspaper articles of attacks on Chinese in the 19th century was that I often felt like I was being socked in the stomach. It was so real to me because this was not just a distanced history that happened to people from long, long ago. This was history that impacted my family members and impacted the ways in which they lived in this country, there was no feeling of really ever being able to not be on your guard. And and this definitely impacted different family members, their health, 
their longevity in this country. And so it was heartbreaking for me to uncover this. I had to take a lot of naps, Marcus. I had to step back, <laughs> step back from my desk and, and take a lot of deep breaths before continuing. As Ava Chin dug into her family's past and the story of Chinese immigration in general, she sensed bravery and resourcefulness in the face of fierce discrimination. I want you now to meet a relative Ava Chin lovingly refers to as Uncle Deck. His full name is Deck Foon, and if you really want to know the precise details, he's her third great uncle, but no actual need to remember that. Just hear a little bit about what happened to him. Deck Foon not only survived the worst of the exclusionary policies against the Chinese, he became a crusader for the rights of all Chinese people who dreamed of U.S. citizenship. Deck Foon was an amazing character, an amazing person. When he comes over into the country, the Chinese Exclusion Act law is only a couple of years old. Deck Foon is able to get in because he lists his occupation as translator for his cousin's medical practice. In reality, though, he sets up a laundry in Nevada City, California. He is here because he he's a father of a very young child, a toddler. He's got to feed his family. He comes to the U.S. with this dream of being able to provide for his family. Unfortunately for him, he lives in California during the height of the worst anti-Chinese sentiment. And he's got to make a decision. Is he going to stay in California or is he going to push ahead and go further into the country and do a reverse migration across the country to New York? And that's exactly what he does. In New York, he meets other progressive Christian Chinese like him. They try to do things like root out vices in Chinatown. His friends try to break up the gambling den networks. They are exceptional Chinese. They're amongst the first Chinese reverends and ministers in New York. Uncle Deck's wife, unfortunately, dies in China, and he's got to make a decision about what to do about his son. At this point, his son is about seven or eight years old. His son can go to school, and he's got to decide, should he bring his son to America, or is it safer to keep his son in China? Anti-Chinese sentiment is strong throughout the United States, even in New York, White boys often pelt Deck with rocks as he delivers merchandise from the Chinese quarter in Manhattan to neighboring boroughs. If these boys treat him, a grown man, so disrespectfully, how would they treat his son? Besides, he's a single father with little prospect of marrying a Chinese wife in New York. Deck would not be able to properly care for the boy here. So he ends up deciding that it's better to keep his son in China. Deck asks his brother to raise his son for him. And Deck continues to send financial support even after the boy becomes an adult. It isn't until his son is fully grown that he's able to bring him to the U.S. for a few years, though the son eventually decides to return to the life he knows best in China. Deck had arrived in New York in 1886, where he remained until his death in 1938. That amounts to over half a century of work and experience and living right here in the United States. He works with other Chinese American leaders to fight for our Chinese civil rights. Remember, Chinese people could not become citizens under the Exclusion Act. And it was part of his long-held dream and desire to become an American citizen. They fight, they coalition build across New York, across Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania to lobby against the continuation and the new restrictions that were coming about under Chinese exclusion. As the decades passed, the Chinese Exclusion Act laws were becoming more and more restrictive. So Uncle Deck, one day at church, meets a woman whom he falls in love with, That's Elva Lisk, our Aunt Elva. 
Aunt Elva was a, a white woman who was born in Pennsylvania, was the daughter of a Civil War veteran. When she met Uncle Dak and they, it was second marriages for both of them, when they got married, it would have been a bit of a scandal, right? This is a period in time in which most American families would disown their daughters for marrying outside the race. But Aunt Elva is harboring a secret that destroyed her first marriage. We won't talk about it here. You'll have to read the book in order to find out what that is. But the two of them get married. Her family members told me that they were happy that Aunt Elva had finally found love, someone to love her and care for her. And the two of them have this really amazing marriage. Uncle Deck and Aunt Elva never had any children, but they did take in members of Deck's extended family. And Aunt Elva helped those relatives get a solid footing in this country. Because of Aunt Elva, they spoke English at home, so the language barriers were not as great for them. It turns out that my family, because my great-grandparents lived with Uncle Deck and Aunt Elva, the lingua franca of the household was English because nobody wanted to be rude to the matriarch and speak in a language or a dialect that she didn't understand. Unfortunately for Aunt Elva, a couple of years after marrying Uncle Deck, the U.S. government decided that an American woman's citizenship needed to change to reflect that of her husband's. And so a couple of years after getting married, because the law was retroactive, Aunt Elva became, in the eyes of the law, a Chinese. And so many American women who had married foreigners did not realize that this happened because this was an act that was as passed by Congress and signed by the president, but with very little fanfare in the news. The only time in which most of them realized that they had lost their citizenship was years later when women gained the right to vote. And when Aunt Elva registered to vote, she got rejected on the basis of the fact that she was no longer an American citizen. She was considered a Chinese. Have you tried to envision that scene? I tried to, but the whole thing from my perspective, and many women that I talk to, Chinese American, Asian American, or white are shocked when I tell them the story because many people are not aware of the fact that this was a law that was on the books and that it, this impacted so many American women. And Elva, I still don't know, in fact, if she was ever able to gain back her American citizenship. She ends up passing away in the 1940s after the law is revoked. But because she was considered a Chinese, she would have had to wait in line with the other Chinese to try to naturalize. And it would have been a very long line. This book, Mott Street, wasn't something Ava Chin decided to do on a whim. No, it was a decades-long project, even an obsession. What's more, she slowly began to feel like she wasn't left to resurrect these family stories all on her own. The more she dug in, the more she sensed ancestral presences, deceased family members with and around her, somehow sharing in her quest. This is Constant Wonder, and I'm Marcus Smith. working on this book for quite a long time, since I was a little child listening to the stories about our railroad worker ancestor, all the way to when I was a student in college, yearning to understand myself and my family. And I decide to do research. I work on like this paper for my class. And after the semester is completed, I had an opportunity to go to Salt Lake City and I visited the genealogy library there. This is an era way before the internet where the only way you can actually do a lot of this research was to do it at the archives. And one of the best places for family research was the genealogy library. So I went there, I found out some information 
Just a few facts about Yuan Sun from the census. I write them down, but because I'm still a student in school, I promptly misplace those papers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I meet my dad. I make these art books, like these collages. I'm constantly trying to tell the story. I just can't quit the story. There's so much that I didn't know as a young person, but I still kept interviewing people, taking notes, losing the notes, going to China for the first time, visiting the grave site of Yuan San, right? The railroad builder, trying to pay homage to him. All of the work that I do, this journey that I embark upon as a young person becomes a kind of gift, right? And it's a gift that yields other gifts because all of the research that I did became the basis for this book called Mott Street. Once I become an adult, I become a mom myself. I start thinking about what is the legacy of the story? What is this legacy of being Chinese in America during this period? I start finding those notes that I took as a college student going to the genealogy library. It was all willy-nilly written into like the back cover of books that I was reading at the time. And then like I pick up that college copy of Maxine Honkingston's Woman Warrior and I find my hand scrawled notes from that time period. And then what starts to happen once the book finally comes out is that people start reaching out to me and telling me stories that they knew, both about their family, but also about my own family. And this has continued to happen as I have been meeting people at book events or people just find my email and, and write to me. It's this incredible gift that I never would have thought. I thought that when I was growing up, I knew nothing, right? Because I was estranged from my dad's side of the family. But in fact, once I started scratching the surface, I realized there was a much larger landscape ahead of me. And it was populated by all of these people that I think actually did want to be known. Ava's father, Stanley Chin, provided an important connection to someone who wanted to be known. And we'll tell you about that person's unexpected appearance in just a moment. But first remember, alongside these next details, that Ava's relationship with her father has always been and still is tense. So after she set out in her 20s to find her father, she soon discovered that her half-siblings had experienced a life with their father completely unlike her own. Ava's older half-sister would ride around joyfully in Stanley's Triumph convertible. Summers, the children on her father's side, would chase each other up and down the beaches at the Jersey Shore, grandfathers relaxing nearby in the sun. There were 15 cousins on that side, but young Ava never met them. In the ensuing decades after these discoveries, she carried the heartbreak of everything she'd missed out on, until finally, about three years ago, she met Stanley Chin in his office, where she announced that she had finally forgiven him for abandoning her as a child. He looked visibly relieved, but then replied, Thank you, but I don't think I did anything wrong. Ava realized that there was still more to forgive. Sometimes I feel a little sad because I wish that we did have the, that kind of relationship that I had always yearned for. But I don't know that anybody has the exact relationship that they wished that they had with their parents. But I think that that the part of the journey to trying to understand my father and understand who we are in relation to each other and to understand him as a person, all of that really is the gift. And being able to like hold all of these things, these emotions, at the same time in my heart, right? The pain, the sadness, the love, the understanding. There have been so many times when I've worked on this book where great joy has collided with great pain. And maybe part of being an adult is knowing how to be a container for those emotions, right? <laughs> 
knowing, on the one hand, how complicated Ava's relationship with her father is, and then keeping in mind, on the other hand, what she told us just a moment ago, that she believes her ancestors want her to tell their stories, consider the significance of this event. So, after I met my father, I started asking questions. I found out that his father, my grandfather, who I never met, was a bit of a storyteller. And he had left his oral history at a local museum here. I did not get my hands on that oral history until about two decades later, when I finally was able to meet somebody who had helped establish the local museum. And they realized that as a family member, they should release this to me. Right about the same time that the museum released her paternal grandfather's oral history to her, the historian who recorded it released a copy of the history to Ava Chin's father. And as she said, the relationship between father and daughter was and remains less than ideal. My father gets the oral history and is not sure if he should share it with me. But that night he has a dream. And in the dream, his father comes to him and tells him that he should help me. And then my father called me up and said, I have something to give to you. And he said to me, I don't know what this is between you and him, meaning his father, my grandfather, but I can't get in the way of whatever that is. So here you go. So he gave me the oral history. Well, what do you make of that kind of an occurrence? I think it was meant to be. I really do. Marcus, I actually had access to that oral history. But what was really important to me was that my father had this moment where he realized that there was a connection between the generations that existed posthumously. And that's something that he can't explain, but that is definitely a gift. There's a way in which we are interconnected as family members, even as we're disconnected in other ways. Does this theme descend to you through the Chinese culture in any way? Is there any practice or memory of practices of your even distant ancestors in terms of thinking about forebears, thinking about ancestors, and and feeling their posthumous presence, if you will? Yeah, definitely. I think there is a feeling within Chinese families and within the Chinese culture that there's a reverence for the people who in your family who came before you. Sometimes people call it ancestor worship. I always kind of bristled at that idea. Don't forget that I was raised by Lutherans and Methodists, and the idea of ancestor worship was something that was kind of anathema to them. So I kind of grew up understanding both, that as a Chinese American and my grandfather, the grandson of the railroad worker, believed in these connections, whereas my Lutheran grandmother did not. She saw this as like superstitions. So I grew up knowing both and and maybe in a way feeling slightly conflicted about it. But I think now, having experienced these things, I really do think that there is a connection between folks in the past and us. And there is a kind of a Chinese belief that the borders between us and them are actually way more porous than I think we tend to think. And you're okay by that? I'm absolutely all right with it. Because don't forget, I always wanted to be connected to my family, so I welcome it. Remember Aunt Elva, who lost her U.S. citizenship when she married Uncle Deck? There's one more story you've got to hear from Ava Chin. Aunt Elva lost more than her citizenship when she got married. Her losses continued after her death. I was able to visit Uncle Deck's grave, and I was surprised that Aunt Elva wasn't buried right next to him. There's an empty spot right next to his grave. And then I remember that my grandmother had told me the story that when Aunt Elva passed away, she said 
the extended members of the family took Elva's body away. Elva wanted to be buried right next to Uncle Dag in the Bronx. But instead, her family took her body and buried it in the grave where her mother and her brother were buried. And I wanted to make sure that in some way they could be physically connected. So when I was at Uncle Deck's grave, I took a spoonful of dirt from off of his gravesite, and then I transported it to Aunt Elva's gravesite. Aunt Elva is buried in Brooklyn, two boroughs away from Uncle Deck. When Ava arrived there, she got down and spooned out some of the earth from Uncle Deck's grave onto Aunt Elva's grave. And then she dug some earth from Aunt Elva's grave to mingle with earth from Uncle Deck's gravesite. So I was able to bring them together that way. I felt I could hear them talking to each other. In the beginning, I could hear them talking to me. But by the time I put her dirt onto his gravesite, it was all about them. <laughs> I basically disappeared. Were you just an eavesdropper on their conversation? Did you hear what they said to each other? That's what it felt like. I mean, all of a sudden, I could hear him saying, my love, my love, my love. And that is very significant because Chinese people do not say the word love very often. Chinese people use the word like. In American parlance, to say, I love this or I love that, it's very common for us, right, as Americans to say that in English. But Chinese people, they generally say, oh, I like that. They're more demure about emotions like love. And so the fact that I heard him say my love, it just struck me to the point where I realized I needed to leave them alone. (laughs) So I, I very respectfully left the party so that they could be together. I think of certain sites as really being, a, for want of a better word, you know, sacred. Yes. Have you been back to those sites, back to those grave sites? I've been back to the grave sites. I've been back to the houses that they used to live in. I'm here, actually, in the building where people were born, our building on Mod Street. And I've also been to the sites of the completion of the railroad. And that has been a very happy moment for us as a family. I've also been to the summit tunnels in the Sierra Nevada near Donner Lake and Donner Pass. And I brought my family there. My daughter and I have been able to walk through those tunnels that he helped to create um, for the railroad. And we've done a kind of meditative walk. I've rung a bell to to just honor him as we as we walked through. So these are sacred sites for for us as a family, but also for other Chinese American descendants of railroad workers. When you go to a place like that, where there's a heightened connection to important people of the past that you care for, what happens to your attentiveness in those places? If one's open, one's awareness expands and time seems to slow down a little bit or act in kind of funny ways. But I also think, Marcus, that we're all interconnected too, as Americans, as human beings. We are connected to each other in so many ways that I think is very easy for people to see differences between us. But I think in these sacred moments that we're talking about, I think you can really feel the interconnectedness. Ava Chin is author of the memoir, Mott Street, a Chinese-American family's story of exclusion and homecoming. We've been able to sample only a small part of what she offers in her book, Rich with Family Stories, Tenery Taylor produced this episode with help from Brian Barba and Audrey Hughes. Sound design was by Carly Wilson. Excerpts from the Butterfly Lover's Violin Concerto were from a performance by the BYU Chamber Orchestra. If you like what you're hearing here on Constant Wonder, leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps to get the word out. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio. BYU Radio.